Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of IPcast, a podcast on IP-related matters by Starks, a niche law firm specializing in intellectual property law and international trade law. My name is Maria baitsova winans and I'll be your host today. If you haven't done so yet, do check out our previous episodes of this podcast. They were made with lots of love. In this episode, we would like to give a brief overview of such concepts as parallel imports and IP rights exhaustion. Imagine that you are a student in the United States, let's say coming from Thailand. One day you receive a list of books you need to buy for your studies. You browse the web and with every item added to your shopping basket, you realize that your vacation plans are becoming more and more modest. To the point of being faced with the choice, you either buy those books or you go on vacation. Pick honey. The very same books in Thailand cost significantly less. Suddenly, a bright idea crosses your mind. What if you ask your cousin to buy an assortment of books in Thailand, or maybe better several, and then ship them to you? You could be able to sell these books to your fellow students, pay back your cousin, and still keep some money for an extra daiquiri or two. Sounds like a great plan, doesn't it? The story I just told is in broad strokes the essence of Kirtzang case in the United States. Except that Supap Kirtzang sold somewhat more than just several sets of books. Ultimately, the student won the case against the publisher, John Wiley & Sons, though not immediately and only after five years of litigation leading up to the Supreme Court. For those interested in more details, I'll attach the link to the Supreme Court's decision in the description to this episode. So, what was this case all about? This is where we come to the issues surrounding parallel import. According to the legal definition, Parallel market goods are branded goods that are imported into a market and sold there without the intellectual property owner's consent for that particular market. These goods are not fakes, so it's not a matter of tackling counterfeit. It is a question of reselling lawfully acquired items elsewhere. The classic buy cheap, sell expensive, if you will. Except that it's not a given that this action will be allowed for the particular combination of markets that you have in mind. In the United States before Kirtzang, there were two other famous cases, Jazz Photo and Nine Star. On both counts, the dispute arose in connection with refurbished products imported into the US market. On both counts, the courts ruled that a foreign first sale cannot exhaust domestic rights. Let me pause here and say a few words about exhaustion. Exhaustion of intellectual property rights, also known as a first sale doctrine, in simple words means that After the intellectual property owner makes the first sale of his products, he cannot control the subsequent sale of these products, of these particular products. So if I buy, for example, Tots loafers from the boutique, I can resell them on eBay. Sounds obvious. Otherwise, all these secondhand sales would never be possible, right? Well, if you live, say, in the Philippines and you intend to resell your shiny Tots loafers from an Italian boutique there, I would recommend thinking twice. The Philippines, or also Morocco, for instance, is an example of a country that adopted a doctrine of national exhaustion of intellectual property rights. This means that the fact that IP rights owner has sold his product outside the Philippines does not exhaust his rights in the Philippines. In other words, the IP rights owner can still oppose the import of goods into the Philippines. In the European Union, the applied regime is the regional exhaustion of rights, or better, international exhaustion on a regional scale. Once the product is placed on the market in one of the member states, the IP rights are considered to be exhausted. Now, to avoid misunderstanding, it does not mean that the intellectual property owner loses his intellectual property rights and anyone can now make the product without his permission. No, 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 no. The rights which are exhausted are the right to use, the right to offer for sale and the actual right to sell. Put differently, if you legally bought something in one of the European Union member states, you can, usually, legally resell it in another one. However, if a product is placed on the market in the EU, That does not mean that in the non-EU countries, the IP rights are equally exhausted. And that works both ways, by the way. Obviously, with intellectual property, the principle of territoriality needs to be considered. Very simplified, you can only exhaust what you have. 
There exists no universal trademark, universal patent or universal industrial design. The only type of intellectual property rights which approaches universality is copyright. According to the Berne Convention, a copyright exists from the moment a work is fixed in any form. But even there is a small print. And besides, to the best of my knowledge, Iran is not a signatory to the Berne Convention, nor is the Maldives or Myanmar or Uganda, Taiwan. Therefore, one needs to consider who has what and where first. Coming back to parallel import. Some countries have special regulations for particular types of intellectual property rights. Some have different approaches for trademark exhaustion, patent exhaustion and copyright exhaustion. For example, Japan generally recognizes international exhaustion unless the buyer in the foreign country received a notice of the patent owner's rights. In the US, before the Kirsan case I talked about in the very beginning, there was a different regime for trademarks. For them, the international exhaustion was recognized. And for patents and copyright, for them it was not. Australia will not recognize international exhaustion if there is a contractual restriction related to imports. And so on. One really needs to check the national peculiarities in advance. You're probably wondering why is it all so complex and perhaps the best solution would be to just allow parallel import everywhere or maybe vice versa, just prohibit it altogether. Well, when did all countries in the world unanimously agree to anything? The matter is quite complex and there are a range of pros and cons to each approach. And I haven't even touched upon the question of digital exhaustion, which is yet something else. The bottom line is, while we live in a global world, we might have an illusion of proximity and interconnectedness, there are still quite some differences in regulations and business practices around the world. When you engage in international trade, there are various matters to consider in advance to ensure that you are efficiently navigating its sometimes murky waters. Remember, prevention is more beneficial than cure in all senses. So my advice is, do contact a lawyer in advance. By the way, I happen to know some very good ones. Thanks for listening and thanks in advance for all your likes and shares and subscriptions. For any questions, suggestions, concerns, as well as, of course, for service requests, just drop us an email at info at starks.be. Starks, your sustainable growth supporter.